started. I think people are slowly trickling in from lunch, so hopefully they continue to. Um, just to introduce myself quickly, I'm Walter Dempsey. I'm uh, assistant professor in biostatistics. I'm sort of just running this part, but so I'm going to only talk very briefly and introduce the speakers. You got it? Um, so this session is a research talk session, and we're focused on uh, giving them about 20 minutes to introduce some of their work. Uh, if there's time uh, before their 20 minutes are up, hopefully we can ask a few questions. Um, and for, for now, we're going to start with Brianna uh, uh, Mezuk. Sure. Uh, she is, got her PhD in mental health at Johns Hopkins University, uh, was a postdoc here, and is now associate chair and associate professor in epidemiology and the director of the Center for Social, and Ep uh, uh, Social Epidemiology and Population Health. And she'll be talking about suicide research. Uh, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. My purpose in being here, I hope, is to really kind of foster some new collaborations. Um, my work uh, using data science methods really started literally with a lunch that was organized by the School of Public Health and the School of Information a few years ago where I met David Jurgens, who I'm going to show you some of the work that we've been doing together um, today. And so I'm hoping that if the work that I show you today is of interest to you, that you reach out to me and I'm be really always excited to develop new collaborations. So um, since I, I presume while many of you are, if not all of you are data science experts, you probably don't know a whole lot about suicide. And so let me uh, give you a little bit of background to make sure we're all on the same page. So, um, and I say this also because I know there's a lot of sort of like ideas about suicide that are not actually like supported by data. So the first thing I, I wanna let you know is that Suicide is far more common than homicide in the United States. And in fact, when we talk about gun violence in the United States, two thirds of that gun violence is, uh, are suicides rather than homicides. Suicide risk is highest among men and non-Hispanic whites in the United States. Suicide risk also varies uh, substantially by age. So what I'm showing you here on uh, the, the line graph is showing you the uh, cumulative incidence of suicide per 100,000 by age. You can see that it's highest among those over age 75. Um, it also varies by place. So you, um, you may have heard of sort of the stroke belt in the lower kind of deep south part of America. Well, we have a suicide belt in America too. It runs right up the Rocky Mountains. And so, it, to kind of just set the stage here, when I think about suicide as a public health problem, it's these types of, you know, sort of distributions that get me thinking. So just again, to summarize, suicide is currently the 12th leading cause of death. It was the 10th leading cause of death before COVID. Uh, there's almost 50,000 suicide deaths per year, and that number is just the tip of the iceberg because we know there are at least four to uh, 10 um, suicide attempts for every one uh, suicide death. Suicide risk varies substantially by age, gender, race, and geography. In, in the United States, middle-aged white men account for about 70% of suicide deaths. However, women are far more likely to attempt suicide, but less likely to die from suicide. Again, kind of indicating an example of the difficulty of this problem. Uh, it's more common in rural areas, and it really is distinct from depression and mental disorders. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, only about 50% of people who die from suicide had a known mental health condition at the time of their death. And even among those with serious mental illness, things like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, the vast majority of them will not die from suicide. So part of what I want to kind of make the case today and sort of why data science might be a, a useful tool for, for people like me, epidemiologists who study mental health conditions and suicide, is that we have some major limitations in most of the data that, um, that we have used to date to study suicide as a, phenomen uh, as a phenomenon. The first is that the majority of this data relies on mortality records, and by definition, the person you want to talk to is no longer here. Um, and most of those mortality records contain little, if any, information that was collected on that person prior to death. The second one might be something like healthcare utilization records. However, only a portion of those who attempt suicide ever receive care for it. There's also massive misclassification of self-harm with our, uh, with our um, healthcare records and screening for suicidal ideation is typically just not done in healthcare settings. And while we do have surveys of related constructs, things like depression and loneliness, the correlation between those constructs and uh, suicide attempts and mortality is modest at best. And reflecting sort of the state of the field, uh, a few years ago, Franklin and colleagues published this meta-analysis of 50 years of research on suicide that had this quote that I found both extremely damning but also extremely motivating as a researcher, 
where they said, by and large, the suicide thoughts and risk behavior risk factor fields appears to have conducted essentially the same studies over and over again throughout the last 50 years. And in light of this pattern, it is surprising that it is not surprising that predictive ability has remained nearly constant over the last 50 years. So again, really demonstrating that we need new ways to get at this problem. Their solution to this problem uh, are better methods, including quote unquote data science, whatever they mean by that, uh, to examine multiple risk factors simultaneously and to identify how these risk factors change over time. So it's, it's within that background and framing is the support of our current project, which is called the ATLAS Project. So this is supported by an R01 from NIMH. It stands for Aging Transitions Over the Lifespan in Suicide, and our goal is to understand how major transitions in four life domains, work, housing, health, and relationships relate to suicide risk over the lifespan. One of the data sources we're using in this, um, in this study, and the one that I wanna talk about today, is called the National Violent Death Reporting System. This is a state-based surveillance system of violent deaths, but violent that what the CDC means by that is suicide, homicide, undetermined, and terror-related deaths. The data that exists in this, in this uh, registry are abstracted from multiple and core sort of like original source documents. So this is the coroner medical examiner report. This is the law enforcement report. This is the suicide note if there was one. And trained coders translate these data into both quantitative variables that are available public, publicly available, but also these unique elements of textual paragraphs that are between 150 and 300 words that are written by the state abstractors from those original source documents that are intended to describe the most salient circumstances of the decedent's life at the time of their death. And those circumstances often reflect the quantitative variables that are also in this data, but they don't always reflect that. But before I get you too excited, I want, of course, you all know for garbage in, garbage out. And so one of the things that we've been worried about or kind of thinking about with this data set is that while these narratives that we want to use the data science tools on are uh, written for researchers, which is a benefit because they've written with somebody like me in mind, they are nonetheless filtered through individuals who are abstracting those source documents. And so it means that there might be information bias in the actual narratives. And in fact, just to kind of give you an example, this is every one of these... Um, plots here is showing you a different state because again this is a state-based surveillance system and the y-axis here is number of characters the x-axis is years and so you can see that there is variation both in terms of when states enter the data set but also sort of how much those abstractors are writing in general and in fact some of the uh, work that the first work that we did here was looking at factors that are associated with the length of the narrative of course this is not the content of the narrative this is not sort of the the meat of it but are they is, is how much was actually written and what we found was that there are substantially uh, significant relationships between the older you are the less is written about you if you are not white the less is written about you and if you have lower education less is written about you so these are factors that are already correlated with suicide risk and so what it means is that we have a problem where if we use this data ignorant of these challenges that I've just outlined here, we can potentially just con continue to contribute to inequities in what we know about suicide risk for certain, age, for certain groups in the U.S. So again, as you all know, I'm not going to spend belabor this, but you know, our solution to using uh, these narratives has has not been to has been to use the tools like natural language processing. Um, again, I am not an expert in this. I work with partners who are experts in this, so I kind of want to. I don't want to uh, punt on your questions if you have them about that, but I'm not going to be able to answer them. But I will refer you to my my colleague who can. Um, and so again, we're looking for a way to, to manage these because as I, I, I said, I didn't say it out loud, but we have over 300,000 of these narratives now on, um, in this data set. So I wanna just share two examples of the work that we're doing, one that's been recently published and one that we're still working on. And the first is we are trying to identify suicide related to uh, a particular type of housing transition. This is transitioning into long-term care, or sort of an assisted living, nursing home, independent living, something like that. So this is important from a public health perspective because there are a lot of people living in long-term care. Currently, three million people uh, live in long-term care in some, some fashion, and 25% of Medicare beneficiaries, uh, or including 25% of Medicare beneficiaries. SAMHSA produced a toolkit in 2011 uh, on how to promote mental health and reduce suicide risk in these settings in this toolkit on page two is the following quote, there are few reliable statistics on suicide in senior living facilities. So that was kind of the motivation for the project that I'm gonna tell you about because I figured like that's something I could potentially help with. 
So I wanted to give you an example, too, of a narrative. This narrative, the details of it has been changed to preserve confidentiality, but just to give you a sense of like what is the data that I'm actually looking at. So this is an example that shows you that this person, uh, where they were found, it's very clear in, from the narrative, they were living in an assisted living facility at the time of their death. But if you actually looked at the location codes in this data, if you didn't know about this data or the narrative, where would you think this person was found? The answer is other. So again, showing the value of potentially using these data is to extract new information that's not already available in the in the quantitative variables. Uh, this is a, a table that you're not, you're not intended to read, but what I want to emphasize is that so we use natural language processing to identify suicides that were related to transitions into uh, or out of long-term care. The vast majority of these were people who were anticipating uh, in transitioning into long-term care. The largest group of people we actually identified, uh, about 450 people, was um, where this was cited as the very explicit um, uh, sort of pre preceding feat or event that had happened prior to their death. Um, and we think this is important because this, you can't just enter into a long-term care facility. You have to go through a screening process. There's an admissions process. And what that means is that this could potentially be a point of potential intervention for both individuals who might be at risk of suicide, but also their families to help to support, support them through this transition. And this is the uh, screenshot of the paper that where we published this finding. The second example I want to talk to you about is one that we're still working through, and this is where we're trying to identify uh, a different type of transition, in this case, retirement or work transition, uh, as it relates to the Great Recession. So we specifically wanted to know how retirement-related suicides changed in frequency and character during the Great Recession, which, uh, as you can see here, I'm talking about the financial crisis from 2008 to 20, 2009. Uh, you can see also COVID um, there, just in what that looks like. So here we're looking at about 50,000 narratives among those age 50 plus from 2004 to 2017. We're limiting it to this data, this time period, because we want to have states that were consistently in the um, the uh, the data at the same time, and we also don't want them to like we don't want to use the year one of the data because we know that's the year that they're kind of first getting going with writing the narratives. We tried it. We're using NLP to identify re retirement related cases, and that again, this is a case where it's 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 not a borderline, or I shouldn't say it's not borderline, but it's clear from the narrative that that retirement was somehow related. To to this person's death. That could be that the person uh, was recently retired, they could not retire, they had re depleted their retirement account, et cetera. Um, this, again, this is an example of what a narrative that would have been labeled by our algorithm as being retirement related. Again, it's not, it's, we're, we're not reading between the lines here. It's very clear that this is a person who had a forced medical retirement. So the first thing that in terms of our results, I want to show you that our algorithm didn't just re-identify people whose labor force status is retired. Um, and so, you know, what we can see here, so we had about only about uh, 878 cases where, again, the that we're calling retirement-related suicide. While the majority of those people were, in fact, re retired in their labor force status, not all of them were retired. And so that, again, tells us that we're not just re-identifying data that's already there. If you also look at the distribution or the characteristics of these retirement-related suicide cases, they do look different than people whose labor force status is retired. In particular, they're younger. So that is, cases of retirement-related suicide were far younger than people whose labor force status was retired. In addition, when we overlay this with uh, the Great Recession, which you can see is the, so the, I'm showing you the unemployment rate here on the dotted blue line. The gray line and the black line are showing you the uh, rate of retirement-related suicide. The black line is among people whose labor force status is also retired, so an additional restriction. And the gray line is uh, retirement-related suicide just among people over age 50. What you see is that that tracks with the recession. If you just looked at retirement, that is, or suicide among people who are retired, this graph would look totally different. So I, I'm not gonna show you that in the interest of time, but to kind of indicate that consistent with the hypothesis, that, that this kind of this specific work transition was uh, potentially became more common among suicide death or sorry suicide deaths were more likely to report this work transition in, in concert with the recession is is supported. So in our, my last few minutes, I just want to sort of close with talking about the MVDRS as a tool for addressing our gaps in understanding suicide risk over the lifespan. We know that the quality of these narratives is dependent on the quality of the data that goes into them. This is hugely important because it requires local stakeholder encouragement and buy-in. So. Uh, 
Michigan has a decentralized medical examiner system. All states have a decentralized law enforcement system. That means that when the state coders in the uh, in Michigan want to uh, collate all of the, the evidence they need to write these narratives, they have to have relationships with people from all over the state. They have to have relationships with all these different law enforcement agencies that they don't necessarily, like this is the Department of Health. They don't necessarily have close relationships with the, the uh, Department of the different, different local police departments, which is what they need in order to get the data they need to write these narratives. And so I think it's just important as, to kind of think about where the data are coming from. Um, our work illustrates the information potential is the kind of phrase that we're using of lengthy contextual narratives at a registry scale. Again, the other type of data we have to deal with this are death certificates and medical and, and healthcare records, right? Like this, there's nothing else at this scale that has this kind of detail. And then, while I didn't show you data on this, I want to just sort of talk, say briefly about our approach to science more broadly in the Atlas Project, which is one of triangulation. So we are using these mortal this mortality registry, the MBDRS, in our data, but we are also using several longitudinal population-based surveys that are also collected here at the University of Michigan. That's the Health and Retirement Study and the American Changing Lives Survey. Um, and we're also using multiple methods, that is traditional biostatistics as well as natural language processing that themselves have different sources of bias. It's not that either one of them is unbiased, but they have different sources of bias. And we're also drawing on multiple th theoretical models of suicide. So I am an epidemiologist, but people on our team are also members of the Department of Sociology, Departments of Psychology. And so through this approach, we aim to respond to Franklin's call to refine theoretical models and pose new hypotheses of suicide risk. So we're not just recapitulating the field for the next 50 years. I just want to thank my collaborators, Victoria, David, Aparna, and Tom. This is uh, how to get a hold of me, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. So the, so the question is around social isolation and um, accounting for, um, uh, so yeah, so I mean, we, I, I guess I, I don't really know what controlling for that, controlling for those would, would necessarily look like here. We do know that, um, so if somebody was widowed at the time of their death, for example, there may, they might, their partner would not be around to give information to the, to the medical examiner, for example, which that might explain why older adults had shorter narratives, that there's just like fewer people to tell us about them. Um, and I do think that social isolation has has something to do with it, of course. You know, I mean, I think that's part of the, the kind of when we zoom out and try to sort of say, like, well, what do we see in the NVDRS narratives, which by definition is just the numerator, right? Everybody in this, in this registry died by suicide. And so I need the population-based cohorts, the Health and Retirement Study and the American Changing Lives Study, to actually like get at the denominator and, and understand protective factors. So it's, it's absolutely something that we're looking to do. I, I guess the last thing I'll say about this is I think it also points to the idea of linked transitions. So the idea that someone becomes widowed and then moves into a nursing home. This is a very common occurrence and it's something that we saw in our data. And so if I'm very, but I, I don't quite know the methods that would help us identify those linked transitions yet. So again, from the text, we don't have this happened first and this happened this first and this happened first. But what I could determine from a narrative is a person, you know, is, what is widowed you know, and now is in a nursing home and, or kids moved to home, or moved away or like so, something like that. So I could, tr I could get that, but I don't know exactly how to, how to understand those link transitions yet. Thank you for the question. Hi, Dr. Mezik, do you think? Go ahead, Caitlin. Oh, do you think that the case narratives are shorter because of the police reports on these cases? So we, that's a great question. So um, I, I didn't disclose, but we have both medical examiner narratives and police report narratives. They're two separate sources of data and are two, they're actually coded as two separate uh, things. And so we actually look at, at both. And in the case here, the law enforcement narratives are in blue and the medical examiner ones are in gray and they're both consistently um, shorter for age, but it's, not, it's a little actually less clear for race and ethnicity. Um, so, but then, yeah, that's a great, but we do, we do, separate that for that very reason that um, that those might be different specifically by race. Thank you for that question. We have time for one very quick question if you have it. Yeah. Um, might be a very quick question, you might have like no data. Do you have any information on persons whose primary language is other than English? Oh. 
I don't know. <laughs> I, would, I, won't, I know I won't have it in the surveys because they're conducted in English, but I, I could look to see. What is your thought behind that? I'm Can I ask? Uh-huh. Um, other than English, underreported, often risk factor for certain uh, problems. Okay. Thank you for that. I'll look. I'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you. See you one more time. All right. Our next speaker is Raul Adanya, who got his PhD at CMU and then worked in Behavior Change for Good Initiative as a postdoc at Wharton. Um, did I already – did they just – it's Okay. We're going all the way there. There we are. Um, and is now an assistant professor of health informatics in the Department of Health Management and Policy. Um, hello, everyone. Yep, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Rahul Ladhania, assistant professor of, in uh, School of Public Health, Michigan. And thank you to Midas for this opportunity. Um, today, I'll be talking about uh, our work on evaluating large uh, behavioral science uh, field experiments in the field and uh, the role of AI ML methods in evaluating those experiments. And uh, specifically, I'll be talking about uh, these two mega studies or large randomized trials that our team, BCHG, Behavior Change for Good Initiative, had conducted to increase flu shot uptake uh, among uh, medical and uh, pharmacy patients uh, based on digital interventions. Um, so today is World Diabetes Day. I mean, first we had suicide, now diabetes, so we're getting into a lot of disease classes today. But uh, the good thing is, uh, the good thing, or numbers-wise, 9% uh, of premature global, global mortality can be associated with uh, insufficient physical activity. Um, and in, in the U.S., uh, around 50% of Americans, adult Americans, do not engage in sufficient physical activity. This number essentially becomes around 77% if you include uh, weight training or strength training, but we aren't talking about that. Um, a bold statement, 40% of premature deaths could be attributed to the list of behaviors that could potentially be changed. And what sorts of behaviors are these? These are diet or phys physical activity or preventable health screenings or smoking cessations. Now, I'm a health policy researcher, so I'm obviously aware that uh, this is not undermining the sort of social determinants of health or the policy or the institutional structures uh, regarding access, which are, uh, let's call them the macros, the system level uh, uh, factors which affect these behavior changes. That being said, regardless of, and nobody's saying we're substituting policy level interventions with individual level interventions, but keeping the policy interventions as important as they are on the side, right, there is a case to be made, and I'm going to show that using some examples today, that we can move the needle, albeit by a little bit, and not as vastly as policy level interventions can do, right? But still, we can move the needle a little bit on making this individual level behavior change happen, and that's a low hanging fruit, which we should not avoid. Um, so I, I'm a big Liz Lemon stan, and uh, 30 Rock, right? So Liz Lemon, rock star writer, right? And uh, she essentially has. Uh, a big desire to sort of, you know, be more physically active, you know, but again, lacks the willpower or the energy if Jack, Donahue, or Jenna let her do that, right? Um, on the other hand, but she, knows she sh but she knows she should do more physical activity, but she wants to dig a lot of novels, and she's heavily into sort of what's called junk novels, no judgments there, right? Um, but again, she doesn't do that because she doesn't have enough time. The question is, how do we make uh, Liz do something that she should do uh, maybe using what she wants to do, but is not exactly the best thing for her. There is a behavioral hypothesis called temptation bundling, right? Where you're bundling a should behavior with a want behavior so that there could be the needle could be moved on the should behavior, okay? The question is, is that effective? So uh, work done by my collaborators, uh, Katie Milkman et al., uh, published in Management Science in 2014, found that when uh, they, for college students, uh, who were gym goers and who had an iPod, so clearly a selective crowd, when they were given uh, a treatment which essentially implied that you get an audio, note, uh, audio notebooks based on the 10 most uh, popular sort of uh, audio books, right? Only when you go to the gym, seems to have way more effect, uh, increase the sort of gym visit activity over a period of six to seven weeks. So that small uh, audio books are essentially cost, relatively costless interventions, right? And that could show that that moved the needle on physical activity and behavior change. 
So this leads us to this sort of broad science of behavior change, right? Where you have this array of uh, inexpensive, scalable, potentially sustainable strategies, right, to affect individual behavior change. And that's been tried across an array, a bunch of uh, interventions, be it gym visits, vaccine uptakes, savings, school attendance, and so on. This sort of word cloud essentially is, is a mix of so many of these hypotheses that psychologists and behavior, behavior scientists, right, have come up with and have been testing in individual studies, aimed at making sort of go to the gym more often or do any of these positive behavior changes. So essentially having something like planning prompts or having something like flexible versus rigid uh, reward schedules. And they have been shown to be effective in their own sort of, you know, randomized trials, so to say. So now when you have so many of these individual hypotheses, this brings us to this narrative of mega studies for behavior change. And this is work that I've been a part of as part of my postdoc at Penn when I was working with the Behavior Change for Good initiative. So what are mega studies? These are these very large real world field experiments in which you have many smaller sub experiments or studies running simultaneously with the same dependent variables. So for instance, as I mentioned, you have 20 different hypotheses about what can make people go to the gym more often. So as opposed to having these 20 different interventions, right, with different populations, let's do like a common task framework of, you know, uh, multiple hypotheses and see which one's most effective at pushing the needle the farthest. And uh, our group has sort of run these experiments in partnership with real world organizations like 24 Hour Fitness for gym visits, Penn Medicine, Geisinger Health and Walmart Pharmacy for flu shot box vaccine uptake. And some of our collaborators have worked with UCLA Health for COVID vaccine uptake. Again, all on the basis of these digital interventions. So where do I come into the picture and what really excites me, right, about this research agenda? And that, again, uh, also, as I, sort of, I should have prefaced this. I mean, uh, uh, one objective for this talk is to obviously sort of, you know, I came into Michigan two years ago, pandemic, right? So hopefully to encourage collaborations and uh, sort of discussions on this work and potential pathways that we could go down in. So uh, most studies, uh, as I showed you, right, focus on figuring out on average what's the best intervention, the average treatment effect. Heterogeneity uh, assessments, right, oftentimes are ignored, or these studies are not powered for that, or if they are done, are essentially these subgroup a priori defined, you know, gender or predefined age bins, uh, sort of moderation analysis, which is very common in social science, which uh, oftentimes isn't powered to sort of get that uh, parameter of interest. These are also parametric OLS models we are looking at, right? So ignoring heterogeneity could at best be a missed opportunity, or at worst could be, you know, exacerbating disparities. Think about if your population has racial subgroups and they have different ways of responding to treatment A or B, and you're giving everybody the same one, that's a potential uh, sort of disparity exacerbator right there, right? Um, so here, as I mentioned, right, I mean, moving beyond uh, existing parametric, ML met uh, parametric methods, right, ML methods can be useful here in flexibly estimating heterogeneity and figuring out this, not just what works best on average for everyone, but what works best for whom, based on how we define these sort of subgroups of uh, individuals. So what are my research questions of interest partly? So the, number one is, can ML-driven personalization of behavioral interventions be more effective than assigning everyone to the best for all intervention? Do existing ML methods work for many arms? So a lot of these uh, sort of studies I'm talking about, we've had 50 different treatment arms, right? And again, they might be well-powered for capturing the average treatment effect, but once you get into the ATE, right, they sort of fall apart. So that's some methodological work is also what I've sort of been working on with some of my collaborators uh, at Penn and Stanford. What are the uh, implications of racial disparities for personalization gains? Some work that has been funded by the RWJF Foundation, right, is about whether or not uh, personalization gains have any of these racial disparities based on the population that's sampled for your experiments. And again, something that's also, uh, that I've recently begun working on, can we transfer these personalization rules? So think about the study I just talked about, and which I'll talk about in a bit more detail now, is the, the flu shot study, where we had experiments with Penn Medicine, Geisinger Medicine, health systems, one with Walmart Pharmacy, both aimed at making the flu shot vaccine uh, uptake increase. Can we transfer rules we learned from setting one to setting two, which are very, very different in terms of the population that they have? So I'm going to do a quick overview of ML methods for personalization. I think we can get into details later. But uh, essentially, for causal inference and machine learning, rich literature at the intersection of econometrics, uh, stats, and computer science on learning, heterogeneity, and treatment assignment rules. You essentially uh, flexibly estimate heterogeneous treatment effects and then leverage those flexible estimates to sort of figure out uh, what's the optimal treatment assignment. Or alternatively, you could 
as opposed to doing this two-step process, you directly optimize the utility of assignment of individuals to treatment or the, prob or the classification of individuals to the best arm, so to say. So, now coming to a specific study that I just sort of alluded to uh, a while ago, right, about these two large randomized trials across three different settings that are group ran in fall 2020. At Penn Medicine and Geisinger Health and at Walmart Pharmacy, testing dozens of text messages, all based on different psychological hypotheses, as I mentioned, designed to encourage individuals to get the flu vaccine. Um, so a quick uh, sort of comparison of the two settings, right? Penn Medicine and Geisinger Health, you had patients who had an upcoming appointment at Penn Medicine and Geisinger Health, 20 different experimental conditions, you varied the sort of uh, number of text messages they were getting, the content, the interactivity, and so on. We had around 50,000 patients and uh, sort of a bunch of their observable characteristics. We had a super large covariate space for these patients, right, because we had their clinical history, their comorbidities, and comorbidities, and so on. Walmart Pharmacy, on the other hand, a super large sample, but these were essentially not, not patients who had a long-lasting relationship. These were just customers or patients who had gotten a flu shot at Walmart last year, right? And we had, again, 23 different conditions, varying the sort of number of messages, interactivity, and so on. Here we had around 700,000 patients uh, in our sample, right? Ten times, more than ten times the sample that we had there. Um, the sort of flip side of this one was that we had lots of missingness because these are not patients, right? These are not patients with an established relationships. These are customers. We had 84% missing race ethnicity data, and for the ones that we had non-missing data, most of them were sort of white. We had zip code data, though, which I'm going to use in my subsequent uh, sort of uh, analyses. So just an example of the kind of sort of things that we had, right, the messages that were sent. So let's say for uh, a condition called the flu shot reserve for you, we... Uh, the patient had an upcoming appointment at Penn Medicine, and the patient was essentially sent in this treatment arm, right, details about the appointment, and language on, hey, it's flu season, a vaccine has been reserved for you. Some sort of an ownership psychological hypothesis you're playing with that, right? Protect yourself and your family's health. And again, 24 hours prior to the appointment, you send a reminder that the flu shot has been reserved for you. Now think about 20 different messages based on shared a joke about the flu, one message, two messages, and so on. Similarly, we had something with Walmart where a flu shot was waiting for you. Um, again, I'm not going to get into the details, but again, it leveraged similar sort of, you know, psychological hypotheses that way. So this is a sort of analysis from the main paper, right, where the paper that was published in PNAS, two papers, right, and both of them essentially were doing this horse race of sorts, right? Which treatment on average worked the best, and let's go for that, right? But again, you see clearly even with this, Right? How well powered are we to uh, figure out whether the first treatment, which is flu shot reserved for you, is that better than flu shot reserved for you with the one text thing or so, right? Clearly, no. And uh, that was one of the things that made us think about, does this, I mean, what's the sort of uh, takeaway from this, from an individual's perspective? So what do we do, uh, taking this data? We go for personalization, right? We apply these non-parametric multi-arm causal forests, which on held out patients across the two settings to estimate the individualized treatment effects using the overlapping covariates across the two settings, Walmart and Penn Geisinger. And then uh, the other part that I mentioned, one of my objectives was also to figure out transferability, right? Whether or not any inference that I can learn from the Penn Geisinger setting, can that be transferred to Walmart and, 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 and so on and so forth. So, uh, and there were like four arms which were common across the two settings. So what do we find? Number one, we find that personalization makes a significant difference. So what you see here essentially is in the top row is what is the aggregate effect of assigning everyone to the, to the most optimal treatment arm based on the algorithm that we have learned, right? Um, and in the second row, we have the effect of assigning on average, everyone on average to the on average best performing arm. So we see almost three times, this is the treatment effect versus the control, by the way. So we say personal, assigning everyone to their personalized, opt, and this is all held out data, uh, personalized treatment assignment rules increases the treatment effect almost three times to 3.5 times. Huge effects, I mean, it's not uncommon to see these effects in, let's say, uh, uh, um, a digital setting, so to say, but this was more of a real world patient setting, right, who are getting flu shots, so to say. So that was, that was something that was really encouraging, and we saw the same pattern hold across Penn, Geisinger, and Walmart as well. Uh, because one of the objectives of the grant that we were working on was about racial disparities, right? We were wondering whether or not these benefits varied across the racial groups. And now, uh, for 
This analysis, we just have white, we non-white, um, because we for pen, uh, because we didn't have enough, uh, uh, we didn't go into the granularities of the non-white population in the Penn Geisinger setting. And for Walmart, we didn't really have race information, as I mentioned, right? So we essentially used call white folks the people who were from the top 25% zip codes with the percentage white residents, and uh, non-white were the residents from the bottom quartile of percentage white residents uh, of the zip codes. So what do you get? Again, uh, the, there is not much of a discrepancy between the effects for non-whites versus whites, right? I mean, you have similar 3x to 3.5x across the two settings is what we get uh, across the Penn Geisinger and the Walmart settings. Next is, uh, we, because again, as I mentioned, we were really keen on figuring out whether race was an important factor or not, right? So for the multi-arm causal forest, we wanted to figure out what were the most important variables determining the splits for our, uh, or, or, the, or the variables which mattered for our causal estimates. And uh, across the board for, and what you're seeing here in all the columns, right, for each of the settings, Penn Geisinger, we trained our algorithm on the whole population without race as a covariate, with race as a covariate, on non-whites alone, on whites alone, right, and tested them on the held out set. Race not once popped out amongst, let's say, the top five or to top five variables which mattered for uh, heterogeneity, so to say, here. Um, again, the, the key things that sort of, you know, and most behavior scientists sort of, you know, say that these are the most sort of uh, common villains, so to say, are past behavior, whether or not you'd gotten a flu shot in the previous year, right? Age and comorbidities were the most influential variables, so to say. Um, we also sort of wanted to sort of see whether or not adding or not adding race would have any effect, right? And again, we did not find any differences across the two settings. So essentially what you have in the first row is training your algorithm on the whole population without race. Second row is training the algorithm on the population with race. And again, between non-whites and whites, we did not really see anything popping out at us, so to say. Um, and finally, we were interested in the transferability of findings across Penn Geisinger and Walmart. If I sort of just have the Penn Geisinger setting, right, I learn personalized rules from there and apply them to uh, sort of overlapping arms and covariates in the Walmart setting, do I get similarish estimates? And what was awesome was we did find that. For Penn Geisinger, again, this is on the, on the rows you have algorithm trained on the Penn Geisinger patients, and what you get on the held out uh, Penn Geisinger and Walmart patients, again, very similar estimates across the two settings. So, essentially, I hope I've convinced you, based on these early stage results, again, we're doing a bunch of robustness checks, right, that personalization is awesome, right? At least in this setting, we don't find any ra much of racial disparities as sort of, you know, benefits of personalization subject to, f we're still figuring out the non-granularities granularities in race to see whether or not they make any difference. And what was really cool was that we found the findings were robust across very, these very two different data settings, you know? Large n, small d in one, small n, large d in the other one but the, the findings held. I'm just gonna skip over to that because we also were getting new data for the UCLA health experiment to see whether these inferences also are transportable to the COVID-19 setting um, and then some other work that I've been doing. But this is my team, thank you, and uh, my collaborators, and thanks to Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and BCG for the, for the collaboration. And uh, we also organized this workshop called AI for Behavior Change at AAAI every uh, uh, spring semester. And if any of you is interested, please uh, sort of, you know, uh, submit your work to this one or attend. This is going to be in DC this year. We're trying to get a cool sort of set of speakers and uh, presenters, and uh, would love to sort of have more Michigan representation. Thank you. So you mostly focused on race as a covariate, but, and, but how much was the, the, the machine learning, the fact that it was a black box, was, was it learning things that, say, like a more parametric model that you might specify might try and pick up? I'm just curious the, the, the benefits of those over more traditional like, statistics. Right. So, if, uh, so, so we did try to sort of figure out what, because the black box, right, but sort of backtrack and see which are the variables which really are the interactions which mattered. And uh, I have uh, sort of this one for Walmart patients, right, let's say. So uh, a level two policy tree, and we saw that age and insurance were uh, sort of the factors which were contributing to sort of determining which treatment you should be getting or not be getting, right? Now, uh, again, with, with the policy tree or a forest, right, there's so much that you can change, right? You can have a three level tree, two level tree. So the next step would be to sort of, you know, do a validation test of this one for sure, right? To see whether or not this assignment tool really sort of, you know, beats out 
getting everybody the flu shot reserve for you assignment or not, if that answers the question. And race did not pop out when we did level two and level three of the policy tree. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Zhang. He is a professor in the Department of Nuclear Engineering and Radiological Sciences, and he'll be talking about understandable AI in physical sciences. Hello. Thank you very much. So um, I go with YZ. My full name is Yang Zhang, but I go with YZ. In fact, I've been publishing with uh, just YZ. It's my name for a couple of years. Sometimes the journal have problems. Just tell them YZ is my full name. Okay. <laughs> So, um, so I want to use this talk to uh, help stimulate some discussions on understandable AI or ex explainable AI or interpretable AI. So we are lucky to be able to witness uh, this round of uh, um, AI revolutions. In fact, none of the previous rounds have influenced our lives so profoundly like this time. Who have thought about uh, the idea that was sentenced to death by Marvin Minsky at all now have uh, resurrected. So, uh, so these progresses uh, have um, um, not only impact our life, but also fundamentally challenge our, uh, our philosophy and our um, humanity. So um, in physical sciences, so, so clearly it has been a paradigm shift uh, in the methodology of using. So the traditional approach, which we call um, human learning, okay? So uh, all of them start from data. Sometimes we ignore, we collect the data first, we start from, from hypothesis. But basically the, uh, the traditional uh, scientific methods is so-called hypothesis driven. So we collect enough data and we generate hypothesis or theory and oftentimes those theories are expressed in terms of uh, symbolic equations. And then based on that, we use logics to derive uh, the consequences of those theories and we make a prediction. Now from the prediction, then we can go back to check whether the hypothesis of theory is correct. So um, if you look at the history, at least uh, there are two stages of a theory. You know, before Aristotle, most of the theories are empirical. After Aristotle, mostly after Newton, we're able to formulate theories in terms of rigorous uh, symbolic equations, quantitative equations. And uh, the triumph is a standard model, which is extremely um, precise. And it's, it's hard to find something beyond the standard model. So, uh, but nowadays we are experiencing this new uh, approach, this uh, machine learning instead of human learning. So instead of uh, trying to uh, deep dive into the theories, we can go directly from data to prediction. And so uh, oftentimes uh, the AI approach hides a lot of uh, complicated stuff in this uh, um, black box, this black box. So, um, so in, in, in my opinion, most of our current AI approach are at most pre-Aristotle. So in one of the main reasons, the likes, uh, it likes uh, the understanding of transferability. Of course, it has a lot of other problems. So in fact, many of the problems uh, led us to the previous uh, few AI winters. Like for instance, it's still quite challenging to represent different domain knowledge. Knowledge representation is still an issue. Um, and data scarcity in many problems. We don't have enough data for us to train a reliable model. Uh, and even if we do, the data quality might not be good enough. We may have large uncertainty in the data sites. So, and of course, we always are always hungry about the computation power. So all of them are, are still problem for us to try. So, so uh, for us, we are focused on really the last one. So this understandability. Like nowadays, the, the, even though we don't know what is going on in this black box, the, the have learning seems to be very, very helpful in many of the engineering problems. So the question we're trying to address is uh, what is really inside this black box? Can we, under, can we provide some uh, human understanding inside this uh, um, black box? So I want to use uh, one of our own research as example. This is, uh, so I'm from nuclear department. Uh, so recently, you know, part because of uh, the energy crisis, there has been a surge interest in uh, developing new uh, so-called advanced reactors. So one of them is so-called molten salt reactor. So they are uh, made, made use of, uh, they make use of uh, molten salts as uh, both the coolant, sometimes as the fuel as well, and they are inherently safe. Now, there are many reasons we want to develop this modern cell reactor. So uh, the work we did is uh, in order to understand this particular um, chemical, and uh, we uh, use a neural network force field to, de to, uh, to, uh, to simplify the interaction between different items. That allows us to run simulations uh, from, um, to, to, to scale the simulations from like a few hundred items using density functional theories to millions of uh, ten, uh, hundreds of thousands of items. 
So it has been shown quite successful, but unfortunately, so there are even number of uh, chemical systems for us to study. So every time when we want to learn a new system, we have to redo the entire training again. So this uh, black box uh, really works only well for one system. So, but if you want to transfer that knowledge to a different system, we have to do all over again. So the, the goal showing in this slide is not to brag about our uh, cover uh, image. It's actually to show the problems of this research. So we are only able to study one salt, not the others. So this is really the driving force uh, for us to develop an uh, understandable method. Like from this neural network false field, is it possible for us to extract some useful analytical information? And if we can that can be used for other systems as well. So uh, what is understanding? So I have to draw back, uh, draw you back to, this is one of my favorite uh, pictures, like of course from Picasso. So um, Picasso in uh, 1945 uh, uh, spent during the Christmas time uh, draw these 11 uh, lithographs. And from the beginning, he started from a very realistic uh, bull and uh, progressively, he dies, uh, visually dissect this bull into the essential elements. At the end of the day, so a bull simplified to this. So when I saw the picture, I thought this is uh, what we uh, data science they call dimensional net reduction, dimensional net reduction. So, and this is really the first step for us to develop understandable uh, AI. So just like as a physicist, uh, we, we, well sometimes, but as data scientists, we call them descriptors. As a physicist, we call them outer parameters. If we are able to extract these key uh, parameters of system, then we can uh, establish a uh, analytic equation to describe the system. So, uh, so going back to problems uh, we are dealing with, uh, the approach we use uh, is uh, based on autoencoder. So autoencoder is uh, just a special kind of uh, neural network. It has a small new, um, bottleneck layer. Has been very useful uh, in multiple applications because you can compress the data through a, f a small number of degree freedoms and then expand them uh, back to the, uh, the original data. So we can use that for, for data uh, denoising, for compression, for generation, and also can help us to do nonlinear dimensional reduction. So, uh, so this middle layer is sometimes called latent variable or collective variable, depending on uh, the field you're coming from. This is a very useful approach, but one of the challenges we're facing, like when we study the physical system, is uh, we don't really understand the physical meaning of the collective variables. So they are a some linear or sometimes nonlinear combination for input data. We don't really know how to interpret those uh, uh, small number of collective variables. So the question we're trying to address in our approach is really, what is the physical meaning of those autoencoder learned collective variables? So, uh, so to do that, this is uh, overall uh, our approach. We pick a simple uh, molecular system, it's an alkane system, and to start with. So if you look at this molecule, it has uh, like four carbons and a few number of 10 hydrogen items. If you count the number of uh, degree freedoms, like you times three for each of uh, the item, even if you take away the translation rotation, uh, rotation symmetry, then we still have a few tens of degree freedom. But we know as a physicist that there's only one degree freedom that matters, which is this dihedral angle. So the question is, uh, is it possible for us to automatically extract this dihedral angle? If you, even if you imagine many of the uh, dimensionality reduction methods that we are more familiar with, this is not a trivial task because this involves a nonlinear mapping between the coordinate and the angle. So well, of course, there are a few uh, methods that can deal with that oftentimes uh, involves uh, um, some basic given information of the cyclic uh, co variable correlations. So we want to do a, a general approach to uh, discover this hidden dihedral angle from this high dimensional data. So uh, our approach is, uh, uh, is, is, is the following. So we start from out, uh, hierarchical encoder. So that allows us to uh, determine the optimum number of, uh, uh, of uh, hidden layer, the optimum number of these collective variables. So after that, uh, we run a traditional autoencoder. So the autoencoder is going to reduce the high dimensional data to two dimension. Then from this two dimensional data, we can construct the, the probability density function. In real system, we have the free energy. We basically um, uh, created the free energy landscape of the system. And then the last step is really a critical part. So we are able to use a, a algebraic tool called Morse mu complex and to do topological filtration. And then that allows us to explain and find, find out the relation between these two classic verbs. So I'm gonna show a few of the results uh, in the next few slides. So um, 
So this slide uh, shows, uh, I, I think I'm skipping a lot of the details. So this slide shows that uh, we, um, when we use a different uh, autoencoder architecture, then you can generate a different kind of uh, free energy landscape. You know, these are, uh, if you use a hierarchical encoder, we have this triangular shaped uh, uh, energy landscape, and the, depending on the initial conditions, and then this triangular shape is going to rotate. If you traditional autoencoder, we have more like circular shape, but the circular shape, uh, again, depends on the initial condition. But this already gives us a, 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 a hint. So even though the, the, uh, the exact shape of uh, this free landscape can change, but topology is invariant. So maybe there's something hidden in the topology of this free energy landscape. That's, that's where uh, we learn from our uh, mathematician friends. So uh, in, they have developed this method, uh, Morse mu complex. This, this is used in both algebraic topology and algebraic geometry. So basically, so the Morse mu complex allows us, has a lot of interesting properties, and one of the most important ones allows us to uh, dissect this high dimensional space into this ascending and descending manifold. For each of them, we call that Morse mu cell. And after that, uh, the most important information coming out of uh, uh, that energy landscape is not uh, the individual data point, really the topology of the data. So, and uh, the more small complex allows us to do this so-called topolo topological filtration or topological simplification. So we can preserve the topology feature, topological features of uh, the free energy landscape and identify really the key features. So this is uh, what we did. Um, so, okay, so there's one more step in order to do, to perform the Morse mu complex de decomposition, we have to define Morse mu uh, function. So in the physical system, that is well defined, we have the free energy. So, um, but in other systems, so you can use the probability density function as the uh, free, free energy as well. Okay, so this is the, the result. So the, the panel A shows uh, uh, this free energy landscape of the simple molecule. If you remember, it's a built-in molecule, and uh, we uh, reduce the, um, the degree of freedom into two variables, collective variable one, collective variable two, and then we plot the free energy density function on this figure. And it's pretty noisy because the data is noisy. We have a lot of thermal noise in the system. So if we directly perform the more small complex decomposition, we got a lot of uh, small regions. But those are not really the important ones. So the next step we did is uh, using this uh, topological filtration. Uh, the right figure shows the so-called sub-level size persistent diagram, which basically measures the most important topological features of the figure. And then we can get rid of the small detailed ones. Then they end up with a, a much more simplified uh, topological graph. Then we can trace along the boundaries of uh, uh, this um, um, more small complex that allows us to link the, the meaning of these two clapping variables. Okay, so let me show you the, um, the, the, the final movie. So here I'm showing you three different systems. So the, the first one is the built-in system, as I mentioned, has a, a uh, two, we, we use uh, two collective variables, uh, and but both of these two variables are connected with each other. If you go around a boundary of the more small complex, that allows us to show, uh, okay, actually it's this one. So if you go around this, uh, this black circle, it shows that the meaning of this collective, collective variable one, two, is really representing this uh, uh, dihedral angle. We can see the molecules rotating around that dihedral angle. So, um, so this is a very very simple system. In fact, it's only one dimension or two dimension, and we can go to higher, higher dimension, and that's where things become more interesting, complicated. So the second example is uh, uh, this pentane system. There we have five carbons, but again, the, two, the only two degree freedom that matters is two dihedral angle. Now if we go around, uh, you know, it's much harder to see where the boundary is, but we go around uh, this, uh, uh, the boundaries of more small complex were able to identify both of uh, the dihedral angles. So to give that in turn give meanings to the to the clever one too. And then lastly, this is even more complicated molecule is a, a cyclohexane. The cyclo yes, it's a cyclohexane. Um, then you can uh, we can also identify the most the the collective motions uh, that determine physical properties of the system is uh, as shown here. Okay, so uh, let me summarize. Um, so overall, so um, the, the, the main problem trying to address is how do we 
give uh, um, more human understandable uh, explanations to this black box. And there could be many ways. So what we show here is a uh, is using the topology, and that is one one method. There are many other methods that have been actually being developed. So uh, the the most important take home message is. Uh, the, uh, the development method to unravel this black box is really urgent and needed. And physical science might be a good test for this kind of problem because in physical science, oftentimes we know what the ground truth is. So we, in a way, we know the answer of the exact system. If we can automate the process, then we can give more trust to the methodology we develop, then we can use them for more complicated systems. So by that, I, I want to stop here and leave enough time for discussions, and uh, I look forward to uh, your questions and uh, uh, discussions on explain why. Yeah. Thank you. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned you wanted to focus on understanding because you were running these these uh, these algorithms on each different uh, uh, particular setting for this salt application, and then you focused mostly on understanding one particular setting using this um, this Morse uh, this, this complex idea from uh, topology. I'm just curious, how do you use it for transferring across? So 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 is there a way to then take that and then do, do the transferring that you talked about at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah. So the the idea is uh, again, we start from a simple system when we know the answer, then we demonstrate this methodology can work, can automatically extract this collected variable. Then we can go back and apply them to more complicated system. So I had not showed the result, and there's a reason because this this computation is very very expensive. We so far we're not able to apply this new or this more small complex method to the original molten salt systems because of uh, um, to I, I skip a lot of uh, technical details to in order to uh, do the more small decomposition. We need to triangulate the data. And the final computation scales uh, with the cube of the triangulation. So extremely expensive calculations. So that's why we're not able to go beyond uh, you know, a few hundreds of degree freedom yet. But the, the hope is, uh, is eventually we are able to do that. Next speaker is Musharraf Chowdhury from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, and he will be talking to us. There you are. Uh, let's see, oh, we got to keep going. About uh, federated learning uh, and data privacy. So this talk is going to be very different from, uh, I guess, everything else you've been hearing about today. Uh, there is not going to be I don't know, any analysis, any graph, or understanding any real problem. It's more about how can we build tools to enable all of you to keep doing what you want to do, but doing so in a way so that you don't really have to collect data in any centralized location. So for the course of last five years uh, in CSE Michigan, we've been uh, building this set of tools, essentially a platform called FedScale, where the goal is to make sure that your data, wherever it is generated, uh, in your phone, in your browser, in your computer, in some cluster far away, uh, under a telescope that is looking into the sky, wherever the data is generated, data stays there. And all your computation can be distributed across the world, and then you want to uh, compute everything and then still get the same result. So, and I don't have to convince anybody here that machine learning is everywhere and data science uh, is probably going to be the way we are going to you know, reinvent everything. Uh, and of course, we have to go back and try to understand and explain why they are working. But uh, at the core of all of these advances, um, the key enabling factor for last at least 15 years have been cloud computing. Uh, essentially, we have, assuming you have money, you have infinite compute and storage. You can dump all the data into the world I mean, that you have and you can collect in the cloud. Then you get a bunch of GPUs and TPUs, what have you. And then you analyze and run whatever machine learning model you want to train. And then you get whatever result you can get. It turns out that increasingly more so data uh, is becoming heavier. You cannot move all the data anymore. 
there are a variety of reasons. For example, many of the talks and the posters I was wondering around earlier, uh, we are trying to understand I don't know, genomics and circadian rhythms and other private data and personalize and change people's behavior. All of the data are very private, very personal. And the way all of these analyses, as far as I can tell, have been going on is that there is some data scientist, researcher, famous professor, we trust them, they're collecting all that, our data, looking at them, and then I don't know, who knows, maybe they are, I don't know, okay, but who knows who else have access to that data. And uh, as a result, there are increasingly uh, more and more regulations coming out that is making it very difficult to move data around. Um, uh, some of them, I guess, are more familiar, especially in EU, we have GDPR that I'm sure you see in the news every few weeks, they are fining this and that company for billions of dollars. But even in the US, in different states, new regulations are coming out. And going even further, different platforms, iOS and Android and all the browsers, they are putting in more and more constraints in terms of how people can or cannot be tracked. And I'm sure you have read in the news that because of Apple putting in some privacy restriction, now Facebook is losing $10 billion. They're stock is down the drain, thousands of people are getting fired, and so on. So all of this is have, uh, have real implications. And also there is this problem of cost. Cloud computing seemed good back in the days when problems were smaller. But now that you have infinite storage, we are collecting infinite data, but also we are raking up very large bills. And we don't necessarily need to collect all the data. At the end of the day, even when we are doing data science, we care about what we can learn from the data, not necessarily the data itself. So the idea of federated computation came uh, from sort of this simple notion that the amount of compute that we have distributed in the world today, since say the first iPhone to now, in last 14, 15 years, the total amount of computation capacity in our pockets have increased, like if you add up all of the phones, roughly by 100,000 times. We basically can store all of the data in the world that we're collecting in the cloud and more in our pockets because those data are actually being generated in our phones and devices. Then they are being copied over the network. Then they are going to the cloud. Then they are doing something. And uh, what federated computation tries to do is that you still have your centralized aggregator, but the data stays distributed and it's locked and secure and private and encrypted and no one gets to see the data. People can ship compute to the data, and then the computation runs, and only some updates, gradients are sent back. And even then, you can use um, techniques like homomorphic encryption or differential privacy to make sure that no one even can look at them. And some of the challenges of federated computation, and this is I'm drawing a very uh, sort of one aspect of it, where it's, which is called cross-device federated computation. You want to do a training in a federated way where it's running on zillions of phones that we have in our pockets. And um, assuming you are using anything built by Google in your phone, all of you are part of some federated computation, unless you have opted out explicitly. And what happens is that you have this massive scale of all these phones all over the world, and each of the phone, each one of us have very different data. And there is no way data can be shuffled around and make, I don't know, normalize an IID because no data is moving anywhere. I have some weird data, you have some other weird data. They are in your pocket and mine are in my pocket and no one can mix and shuffle them. The devices are very heterogeneous. Uh, there are hundreds of different types of phones and operating system combinations. And it's very hard to, I don't know, build a system that can tackle all of them. And also, all of the devices are in our control. I can turn my phone off, I can disconnect it from Wi-Fi, so even if some computation happened, they may not be able to move around because uh, there is sort of no connection. So what FedScale provides is a platform where you can do training and tuning before you want to train and testing your model and you can do analytics, basically trying to compute simple statistics on data that are in phones and computers and browsers and smart devices or in large clusters that are distributed all over the world. And Users, the data scientists, machine learning engineers at the top, they still use the frameworks that they probably have been using. Uh, I'm sure many of the talks and posters, they have used TensorFlow and PyTorch or Apache Spark, things like that, to analyze and process all of their data. We can still write the same model that you have written. 
without any changes. And after that, all the training will happen in a distributed fashion across hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of phones. Think of you have built an app, you have uh, deployed the app to your study population, and now instead of all of the apps sending data to some, I don't know, some secret database you have in your office corner, the data just stays there. Instead, whenever you or you or any of your students, postdocs, data scientists, they want to do some computation, they write the same program, they want to train, and then many, many rounds of training happen, and in every round, we first select some phones, then we execute them on the phone or the browser or whatever device, and then all of the data will be aggregated, and then at the middle, there is an orchestrator that makes sure that everything sort of works well and things are still connected, even when we are turning phone on and off and there is no battery and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to give a quick sort of overview. I said there is no graph, so it's not really a real graph. It's more like, uh, I don't know, I made something up with some real numbers. So in the x-axis, we have number of rounds it takes to get to a target accuracy. So we are trying to train a very small model mobile net on an open image uh, sort of the data. And in the y-axis, we have average round duration. Basically, the fewer rounds it takes, the faster you can train. Uh, and of course, if each of the rounds are smaller, the faster you can train. And the orange point is the centralized training where all of the data set is in some cluster, my laptop or your laptop or big data center. We have shuffled them, I don't know, and then we are just training them. And it goes very well because we have access to all the data all the time. The other corner, we have state-of-the-art federated learning solution where because all of the data is distributed and you cannot control who will be up or down, we are selecting at random, then we try to, I don't know, run some computation, and whoever finishes computation, we aggregate them, and we do many, many rounds of them. Because we are missing data, and the data is now heterogeneous and haven't been shuffled, uh, each of the rounds takes longer, and the number of rounds also increases to get to a particular target accuracy we have. So what FedScale provides is while the training is going on, it runs a meta-learning process. Without going into the details, it tries to figure out which of these participants where training is running are more valuable, as in they provide bigger changes to the model being trained. So it uh, finds them out, and it exploits these high utility clients. And by doing that, it increases on both axes. It makes rounds faster, and it also reduces the number of rounds. And essentially what happens is that by using a fraction of total data that you have um, in your centralized training, it can go very close to that centralized point. And of course, if you allow it to take more resources, it can get even better performance. So essentially, the highest level takeaway is that many of the training that we do on a lot of data set, most of the data don't really add much value to the training. We have to figure out what are the more important ones and sort of put them together so we can train very quickly. So this is just a very high level, I don't know, summary of the results, and there are many, many results in many of our works. But uh, I am just representing two workloads. One is a vision workload, uh, one, another one is NLP. And uh, in comparison to the state-of-the-art solutions, we have significant improvement because we can identify uh, things better. More importantly, in comparison to the centralized training approaches, we can go very close to them by using 100 or 150th of the resources needed. So you can apply similar techniques even in the data that you have already collected, and by doing that, you can make your machine learning process and data science cheaper. Uh, I'm sure all of you have faced this problem where you have too much data, and GPU cost is, I don't know, very high, and you can use uh, tools like FedScale to make it easier and better. And before you get to the real system, you may want to try out sort of in different types of data sets. So we also have collected and curated uh, 20 plus data sets across variety of tasks and model combination that you can use in your laptop or 